Awesome, and we are in. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Monday Meets with the Willow Domestic Violence Center. I am the Director of Communications at the Willow, Will Averill, and with us today is Christy Heigelow from the Sexual Trauma and Abuse Care Center. Hi. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, human trafficking this week because it is the end of Human Trafficking Awareness Month, and um, Christy is uh, the, the, the Care Center is a member of the Human Trafficking Task Force, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that and how trafficking presents itself in your organization and a few other things. If anybody has any questions as you're watching this, you can throw them in the comments. They're below on the live broadcast. I will be keeping track of that throughout the uh, show. So if I'm looking at my phone, Chrissy, I'm not being rude. I'm just trying to see if anybody's asked any questions. Um, and if you have questions that you're not comfortable asking live, you can always email those. I will put my email address in the comments below as well. Um, if you are in danger or if, uh, if this is a situation in which you need assistance, you can call the hotline at 785-843-3333. So give us a call if you need assistance. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and kick things off. How are you? I'm doing all right. All we right. made it through January, so moving along. Yeah, it, this month went really, really quickly, I feel like. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so why, uh, will you tell us, start by telling us just uh, about yourself and your position and uh, a little bit about the care center for folks who may not know much about it? Sure. This is one of those things I love to talk about. I'll try to keep a little bit slow because I've gotten like my elevator fader speech like very quick and snappy. Um, so uh, hey. my name is Christy Heikla. Uh, so I've been um, uh, with the care center since 2009 and I've been the executive director since uh gosh eight years ago whatever that is 2013 um and uh before that i worked at, in domestic violence and in a shelter in minnesota and also i worked with like girl scouts and at-risk kids and literacy programs so nonprofits kind of been my jam for my whole uh, career and um i at the sexual trauma abuse care center we are actually this year is kind of a really incredible year for us um this is our 50th anniversary year so uh, we're we're really kind of soaking in the fact that we've had a legacy of 50 years of services and support and just uh, just resiliency along movements and the trends of of what's happened in the past. Uh, it's been pretty. It's it's really an honor to be a part of it at this uh, stage in the game. Uh, so we have three different services that we provide to the community, and it looks really similar to the Willow in the fact that we have. Uh, the same service area. So we serve Douglas Franklin in Jefferson County. And while obviously the Willow focuses a lot more on domestic violence and the human trafficking side, we, uh, we look more on the um, uh, the side of sexual violence and um, uh, sexual trauma and abuse, obviously, it's in our name. Um, so we do, uh, we are really uh, like, our services break down into three different things. So we have advocacy and response, and that's kind of, that's what we've done since day one. So that's since 1972, we've been providing response and support to folks um, in the community through a hotline. Uh, we go to the hospital and provide um, advocacy during a sexual assault nurse examination that happens there at Lawrence Moore Hospital, and then um, go to courts, go help with protection orders, kind of all the gamut, um, really practical stuff like, navigating school for folks, helping with workplace violence, different things like that, that I think a lot of folks don't necessarily consider uh, the aftermath of sexual violence. Um, um, and, and specifically through the pandemic, more housing, more practical, more financial, just more safety and security um, navigation that we've been definitely doing. Um, after our advocacy and response program, we have uh, therapy. Uh, and while, as I always say this, because while all of our services are free, I always bring up that our therapy is free. It's just a unique thing that we don't uh, provide. We don't need a sliding scale for payment. We don't need health insurance or a diagnosis of any sorts. Um, you you don't have to necessarily our, like our qualifier is really um, if you've been affected by sexual violence. So what that looks like is the majority of folks have experienced sexual violence personally that access our therapy program. But also it's there for parents whose children have experienced sexual violence, um, partners who are trying to support a, a partner better. So we really can maintain that flexibility and low barrier aspect to our therapy. And it's something I think we're really proud of. And um, and it's obviously been incredibly popular. We currently have wait list, um, but yeah, definitely if anyone's interested in that, they should call us. And then finally, we do uh, education and prevention services in the community. So um, I think while all of, all of our services are small but mighty, I think specifically our education services, like 
are so mighty because we are really strategic and targeted with how we do education. While we do kind of the general like sexual violence overview, what is sexual violence, what is consent, um, we specifically target um, uh, age groups and kind of uh, demographics where we can make the biggest impact within our services. So we do, we're in all of USD 497's K through third grade, doing a accredited program called Talking About Touching um, at, to just talk to kids about safe touches, unwanted touches, unsafe touches. And then we're also, um, we also see all the ninth graders as they enter health class. And, and the ninth grade, and actually it's a really cool um, dynamic with the ninth grade because that's something we also partner with the Willow on and let's talk. Um, so we really are talking about intimate partner violence. We're talking about sexual violence and consent. We're talking about sexual health and support with let's talk. So we're able to like really target that ninth grade. And then for our adult programs, we have the Safe Bar Alliance, which I think a lot of folks know in the community where we train uh, bars to pay attention to predatory behavior, and as well as we do a, um, we are a little bit over a year into providing training uh, for a local ordinance for the city of Lawrence. Uh, for local bartenders and uh, uh, managers of drinking establishments. So we also provide, uh, we've been doing that mandatory training for over a year and it's been really incredible. We've reached a lot of folks that really are frontline workers that are able to support the work around the community. So yeah, that's the kind of us in a nutshell at the care center. That is uh, an amazing <laughs> list. I, I feel like uh, you all have the, the same uh, challenge that we do, which is uh, kind of a nightmare for a communications director of having so many amazing programs that like trying to talk about them succinctly, succinctly is always Yeah, really yeah. it's hard challenge. to like snapshot such complicated and thoughtful work in a way yeah. that people don't get overwhelmed or yeah. Yeah. I mean, just elements of it alone, like the, the you know, any of those we could make it a, a, a full, you know, program on. It's it's yeah. fantastic. We could do a full talk on. Um, but I, I have to say I, I really love the, the Safe Bar Alliance. I, I think that's a fantastic idea. And I, I really think it's I think gonna be beneficial, particularly to a community with a, such a thriving kind of college uh, service industry and yeah. And and that program is I we're so proud of it because we're really one of the first um communities in the nation that started that. We've been a model for like uh, the state of Arizona modeled us for how they handle sexual assault and bars. Um, it's become a uh, CDC accredited program that gets funding from like uh, sexual violence prevention program. And so it's like we've we were really at the forefront for seeing this being developed nationwide as a like an actual tactic to like navigating sexual violence. So it's something that we like just hold really close to our hearts and are really proud of that work. Nice, nice. Well, today we're going to focus uh, a little bit differently on, on human trafficking um, because it is the tail end of Human Trafficking Awareness Month and we've been uh, meeting with folks from other organizations and from our own, own organization kind of talking about trafficking and how it intersects with our services. So could I just ask you, like, how do you see trafficking intersecting with the services that you provide at the care center? Yeah, so, um, and I, I was actually thinking about this all day about how I was going to talk about human trafficking, because one, kind of like side note, I've like, now that I've worked in this field locally for, what, uh, 12, 13 years, I've like weirdly become like a local historian on like sexual violence work and like, uh, on tactics. So human trafficking has been an issue that we've navigated um, as, as an agency and as a community, obviously very long term. Um, I remember early on uh, being able to provide human trafficking uh, presentations for folks and navigating that. And, uh, and as like the state and more local or more local and state and federal funding came available, that was something we were very much interested in. So right. um, when, uh, uh, when the Attorney General's office had the human trafficking funding, me and Joan, who was the previous director at the Willow, sat down and like really collaborated together to look at how we could we could work on human trafficking in the community because it's just it's one of those issues. Um, similar to lots of intimate partner violence and sexual violence, domestic violence, that is just like a very, it doesn't fit easily in a box. And it's one of those issues that takes a lot of different people to kind of look at it and, and pull together resources, pull together information, because um, it's, it, um, it's complicated. And I know you know that too. It's again, one of those things that, um, that we still are just really trying to navigate. Uh, so as far as how it presents, um, uh, we see because we are crisis services, because we go to the hospital, because we do a lot of response after that, if someone enters the hospital, um, 
it, it kind of like we're, we're called, we're activated uh, within a, a partnership. So that's some, some place that we could potentially see someone that maybe is pre presenting as more sexual violence, but it could be more of a human trafficking issue, um, as well as just like, um, it's hard not to talk about it in the realm of what coercion looks like, what fraud and force look like, and, and some of the same dynamics that happen within all kinds of forms of sexual violence happen within human trafficking. So, um, so, but, but so, we, and so when we actually, so back to that grant that me and Joan applied for, we uh, got the first funding for a um, human trafficking specialist. We actually housed them at the care center. And after a year into that grant, we were like, this needs to go to the willow. And I think that was one of the complicated pieces of it because we realized since the care center doesn't have a shelter, um, we don't do that kind of um, emergency safety response that you all do. Um, it made more sense that as we were starting to navigate a community response that it needed to be housed in a place that could follow up versus the care center, which was really more about validation support, um, but not about the like of the the um, logistics of how to get someone safe and out of a situation in our community. So that's been so so obviously that bond and that support around human trafficking has been kind of since the beginning of the formalization our community has around human trafficking. So so I was at some of the original human trafficking task force meetings. We've had staff that maintains that. Um, we make sure and, and kind of stay up to date and specialize in that and make sure that we can understand the um dynamics of it but i will say that um like you don't have like and i think this is one of the complicated things about human trafficking i think the language around it is really challenging for folks so some folks consider it more like domestic violence and a partner abuse and a, and a dynamic of that and some folks consider it to potentially sexual assault and lack of um of uh consent and things like that so so we don't necessarily identify everyone that comes in our door into like a nice little package of oh this is a human trafficking survivor because if that's not a way that they describe it um if that's not a way that they consider it that's not language they use that's not a that that's not something they feel comfortable identifying with that's not something we also package them with so I, and i think that's a challenge everyone deals with is like it's hard to figure out the numbers and to be able to identify someone is just like a victim of a, like a of something that that was um fraudulently done coerced things like that versus having this identification of being like a hu being human trafficked so i think that's the other dynamic of it is that um really we just treat we just support people however they come to us whether that's being identified as human trafficking or not um or if they're looking at it more from a sexual assault lens yeah, I, I think awareness um, is is really crucial. I, I remember when we had first sort of uh, when we had first sort of returned to the Lawrence Community Shelter, doing some workshops about um, domestic violence and trafficking to folks who were uh, clients at the community shelter. Uh, I remember Adrienne, who was the human trafficking coordinator at the time, telling me that she had had someone who uh, had just kind of realized through the course of the conversation that they were actually being trafficked. They, they, they knew what they were involved in wasn't entirely right, but they didn't have a name for it. And so they just assumed yeah. that that was kind of what everybody did. So I think, I think you know, the information and knowledge and education, you know, really are forefront on ours. And I know on yours as well. Um, yeah. Minds in terms of letting people know what trafficking is and how it, how it sort of shows itself. And and I think that now that human trafficking is getting more mainstream, more people understand it, at least at the core, right? Like maybe not have a depth of knowledge, but they understand the language. They know it's an issue that that Americans deal with. Um, that it gets kind of um, sensationalized and uh, and hard to identify with in the same way as like somebody could experience a sexual assault that could act that could be absolutely um, categorized as rape. But that's a that's that language of feeling like a rape victim or saying I've been raped is something people will avoid mm. a lot because it's a really challenging way to identify. And I think it's the same way as human trafficking that that folks will minimize it. That language feels really loaded. It feels intense um, that they don't want to feel like they're a human trafficking victim, but they might just have a, and and again through a category they can fit completely into the, the dynamics of human trafficking, but that's the challenges of education, right? Is to make it accessible and um, down to earth in a way that people can connect. And it doesn't feel like overly intense and like we're trying to push language and situations on people that is a spectrum of, of right. what it could look like. 
Right. That is, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's providing that information and that empowerment so they can kind of make those decisions for themselves. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I think you actually kind of had answered my next question um, about what services are provided to uh, human trafficking survivors, which is all of them. Uh, and you did a great job of talking about those services. But um, one thing I, I did want to uh, ask you is kind of, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, you know, the people's idea of what trafficking is can be a little bit skewed. Um, and, you know, we talked in some earlier conversations about how people kind of think of it like uh, out of the movie Taken and, you know, that it happens only overseas or it yeah. involves international waters when it very much manifests anywhere that people are. Um, what is one thing about trafficking that you think maybe people wouldn't know, you know, if they don't have a lot of education and information on it that is, is really important to you or that resonates with you or stands out to you? Um, I think uh, specifically from the sexual violence lens, it's that um, lack of consent and that's that coercion like that's that's really what we're talking to the baseline of what we're talking about it's not this and I think it really is easy to get really um, carried away with um, a lot of the sensationalize of it just uh, again like early portrayals of uh, not portrayals of uh, portrayals of it uh, like that are looking at it from yeah like mail order brides and people getting put into like a cargo thing and brought to America and sold and different things like that. But looking at it like at a much simpler lens of, and and, and, and again, I'm gonna kind of re go back to that language about rape. And cause I really do think that language around rape and human trafficking is really similar in the fact that when we talk about sexual violence, it's um, forced sexual contact, contact. And when we think about that, a lot more folks fit into that category. Um, they might not necessarily identify with sexual assault, rape, sexual violence, but to understand the idea of forced sexual con contact, people will be like, oh yeah, I've had that. Um, and it's in the same way as human trafficking that like when you look at that in a big lens and think about the intensity that the topic brings, that um, media brings, uh, different campaigns, like when we really get down and like take it down to the simple fact, it's it's really about that coercion. It's about that force and uh, force fraud and coercion where we're looking at someone's uh, power, their voice, their uh, decision making taken away, whether that's based on their physical safety, their housing situation, uh, their age, because we also know human trafficking happens to children a lot. Um, so and looking at just that power control within that, I think that makes it a lot more manageable to connect to to understand how that could happen to people that how it could be in our community when we just look at that that dynamic of it and not just blow it into this very big scary thing that that uses language like i said that's hard to hard to a lot latch on to yeah so to, so to kind of uh transition from that into my next question what um then I, it seems to uh kind of set the stage for this question which is you know how does that then how do we see trafficking manifesting here in town in in you know in your opinion what 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 types of cases do we see mainly yeah. uh I, well i feel like i'm i've been like trying to hold off on this rant that i've been thinking about and it's not oh, let, rant, it, let it go it's let it go <laughs> <laughs> so i like knew it was going to come up so here it is um but and i don't get to that question more specifically but sometimes i can get in all of my time in anti-violence work and sexual and domestic violence, which is now what, 15, 20 years, wherever you look at that, um, I uh, think that like I've been, I, I've been, a, I've been really frustrated with how human trafficking had, had can be portrayed, how we can look, we look at it from a statewide issue and how we look at it. But I think the thing to remember is that the movement around human trafficking is still really young. So when with domestic violence and sexual violence, we've been learning to talk about this, think about this issue since the early 70s. And, you know, and that's when we started formalizing our conversations about what it looked like. So when you look back at tactics and education around domestic violence and sexual violence in their 70s, they were innovative. They were they were front of the line, but they were things like rape whistles and things like that that we would never give to survivors now we know that that kind of tactic so i think that that's something to remember is that like we're still really early on so we're still trying to identify appropriate language not trying to sensationalize it i think i mean there have been missteps i remember a campaign for the state of kansas years ago that used like the wizard of oz dorothy as like the human trafficking victim on posters Okay. And, it, you know, like it was, and like, that's like, like, these are the kind of people that get trafficked in our community. So again, I think, and of course that like, 
I can understand why they were trying to like pull the heartstrings and connect to people, but we're we're going to look back. We already look back at that as a misstep and an inappropriate like lens of how to navigate human trafficking. So I try. I'm so I guess I'm saying that that like we still have a lot to learn and we have a lot to finesse. We have a lot to con connect to as a community to really look at this picture and understand the scope of it. Um, similarly, like I said, like give us 20 years and we're going to be in a place that is domestic violence, sexual violence. We can look at it in a broad lens that isn't just specific to um, like heterosexual couples and different, you know, just different things like that, that we can look at victimization from along it line. So I think that's the first thing to remember is that like um, when we looked at victims of human trafficking, we really, aren't at a place to have a full scope of what the victimization looks like in our community. But I will say that um, when I when I think about it, I would ask like our community in general to push back on that idea in their head of what it looks like, because um, in reality, it's a lot more family based um, and uh, parents, adults, uh, part uh, uh, caregivers that are uh, using children for in situations of human trafficking and again something I think that is oftentimes not necessarily looked at I think people are really looking at it from like a pimp and his and his like prostitutes and different things like that and we've got to push back on that because in reality what we're looking at is like um more covert ways of like um uh getting somewhat someone needing a a place to stay on a, a, a for a weekend and uh, being having to trade sex for that um, and making that decision that is absolutely coercion, but in their head, it felt like a, it could feel like a decision being made in that prospect to, like whether I'm gonna stay on the streets or I'm gonna stay on this couch, I have a decision to made, make to use that. So I think that um, we have to make sure we're considering like kind of the, the quieter ways that human trafficking can happen and that coercion and that safety piece and specifically through a pandemic, like we have, no idea how the pandemic has has affected human trafficking survivors because i think it's one of the quieter um, victimizations that can happen um because there hasn't been as many resources and there's been limited safe shelter options and opportunities to for places so we know that coercion and uh safe housing and different things like that are affecting it so long answer i knew i was going to go on a tangent with that <laughs> one but like <laughs> I was like, I'm going to go on that tangent, but I do like, I just think we need to, first of all, push back on our, our personal perceptions of it and recognize that it's a lot more complicated, insidious and um, uh, more relevant to our world than we think it is. And then also to understand and also give it grace in the time that we, understanding how where human trafficking is as a movement that mm -hmm. like our understanding and development of this work is happening every year we get better at it. Like think about, I mean, in your time at the Willow, and my time at the care center like we're getting better and better at considering what this looks like for survivors and like being able yeah. to like connect the dots in our community to support survivors wherever they're at in that process absolutely and, and i'm so glad that you you brought that up because i i do think it is you know dangerous people people really seem to care and resonate with trafficking uh, you know uh, for us in a way that that maybe they don't as much with domestic violence and we, we see kind of more attendance at trafficking events and more interest in and trafficking is one of our more talked about sort of issues that we we work with and i think people can tend to have a myopic view and look at it primarily as massage parlors and prostitution and game days and all of that while yeah. not looking at the fact that it can it, it does exist anywhere that there are people and that family element and that guardian element and the fact that most people who are trafficked have a prior relationship to yeah. their abusers it's 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 again that same again to translate it into sexual violence progress and how we talk about it it's it's the stranger behind the bushes which is what we were all taught to be terrified of when we look at sexual violence it's almost always acquaintances and always people we know so it's the same thing with human trafficking again it's like we're just we just have to move away from that imagery of it to like the reality of the situation and the and the complicated nature of having someone that people can love and people that they're caring for that are also like creating dynamics where they can be really dangerous and harmful and um yeah so we just gotta keep pushing it forward yeah and speaking of pushing it forward if you have any questions on our uh, conversation today do feel free to throw them in the comments um you can ask myself or chrissy anything you'd like about trafficking we would be happy to answer if you don't feel comfortable uh putting your name out there or you would like to ask a question anonymously you can email me at waverill at willowdvcenter.org it's in the comments i'll be happy to uh we'll get back we'll get it on on the air if we're still talking if not i can get you an answer and get back to you but um 
let's talk a little bit about the task force because that is one of the the main thrusts of the task force is to raise that awareness um what would you like to see the task force do as it continues to grow and develop because i feel like it's really come into its own within the past sort of year or two years yeah so um and actually i, I connected with aj gonzalez who's one of our advocates that attends task force force meetings kind of maintains our direct service expertise and, and knowledge base around human trafficking. Um, and I was just like, hey, how's it going with the task force? I'm going to be talking to Will today. And I mean, and I think it's this and I think honestly, it's the problem with like so many of our initiatives locally is the pandemic disrupted everything, right? Like momentum, yeah. um, dynamics yeah. of people's availability, sickness, um, uh, being able to have like the same thing with any kind of task force, too, which is that like groundhog day environment where every month you're like like okay we're gonna do this thing and then the next month it's like five other different people and then they're like okay we're gonna do this thing and then you just yeah. like keep talking about it so i do think that's it's attraction right it's like being able to like get our bearings in the in the middle of a pandemic and work on really hard complicated stuff as a as a community um where where people have limited energy people have limited um availability um, and there's like, again, just so many different things that are taking time out of our day to day world that like, so I think, I mean, like that, that's really when me and AJ were talking about the task force that, I mean, it's just, we gotta be patient. Um, yeah. and just like, understand, first of all, it's dynamic of getting a whole bunch of people together to work on something. But I do think, I think, Will, you're right. Like the task force is, is really wonderful. It's, um, it's got a lot of uh, representation from important people that need to be there. Um, and then also just the community at, uh, um, availability to it. I think it's I think it's I think it's exciting to see folks coming together and looking at this this issue specifically as a collaborative community response and not something that is housed within one place, because again, like that's only way we're going to navigate this as a community as we see this as an issue that's not just for one place to navigate or one place to talk about for a lot of us to consider our roles and how human trafficking looks and how we're responding. Well, all of our worlds intersect, but I think more than almost anything, you know, human trafficking is an area which so many services, public services, could come into play. I know Bert and Ash, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll touch on it. You guys will touch on it. We'll touch on it. Um, I mean, it, 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 it transcends, you know, it kind of goes to all of the different different services. So the more that we can kind of come together and think of, you know, collaborate on ways in which to, to, to help folks um, and to empower folks, the better. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us uh, this, this afternoon. Um, I do like to end it since kind of an informal chat and conversation with um, a shout out section. So this is basically your chance to, I know it's your 50th anniversary, um, and I know you've got the your your annual event coming up. Let us know or what, what's coming up for the Care Center this year. Um, so thank you. I'm. I, this is like what I'm going to do this whole year is just plug us so much um that yeah so it, like i said at the beginning and that you just brought up it is our 50th year and it's something that not only we as advocates and staff of the care center feel like so proud of to be a part of it's something that we're as a community should be proud of like that's uh, to have a um formulated sexual assault program and in a community for 50 years is something so many communities don't have the ability to say. Um, and uh, I, and I, I didn't bring this up at the beginning, but I bring it up all the time, is we were really one of the first rape crisis centers in the nation. So how sexual assault response looks like in the state of Kansas was modeled after our, after our program. So that legacy is something that we're really trying to um, uh, pull together and to, and, um, uh, to, to, to like solidify what our role has been in this community and what our the responsibility to survivors as a community has had like we've been in that forefront of sexual violence response since the beginning and i think it still shows with programs like safe bar alliance and having a city ordinance that is is in a city governance that cares about sexual violence in a way that they would look at embedding it and within their ordinances like it's exciting times it's it's like an honor to be a part of sexual violence in this in this new wave of looking at it and considering it but yeah, so this month, so we're we're planning on show up for Survivor on April first, which is the first um, day of Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Nice. So all April, we really look. At, normally, we never have fundraising events in April <laughs> because it's really our time to make beef, do friend raising to honor survivors, really look at the issue. But we had to postpone show up for survivors from the fall. Excuse me, <laughs> and so we um. We pushed it into April because we also thought it would be a really good way to kick off the month and to, to and ho hopefully we're in some kind of like 
COVID lag and the weather's really good and like it doesn't feel scary because right now it feels terrifying trying to plan an event. Um, yeah. <laughs> like it's impossible um, right. but, uh, <laughs> so but yeah we're we're looking forward to that we're gearing up for that as well as just the rest of the month and just the different activities at the end of the month we always do a take back the night and this is something that the care center doesn't necessarily have ownership of this is something that is a community event that we are just kind of the stewards of making sure it happens every year so take back the night is a survivor event um, where we normally do it in South Park, we do a candlelight vigil, we have speakers, different things like that. It's been online the last couple of years, which has been interesting, but that will be on April 28th and we'll also be sharing information with the community on that. And then in the fall, we'll be doing like a 50th year, like retrospective anniversary type deal for the community too, and see if we can get, um, we're just really trying to pull information from previous, uh, advocates and survivors and really looking at what our longevity has been like in this community for the last 50 years. So yeah, all, like get ready to hear about from us like all year long. We're, we're I love here. it. I love it. I, you know, <laughs> we're, we're hitting it. We're our 45th anniversary this year and I'm doing some kind of retro fun uh, t-shirts because I feel like, you know, that, that felt pretty good to me, but 50, uh, yeah, I think we you got to celebrate 50. Yes. That's a that's a huge one. Um, it is. If, it people, is a big one. If, if people want to uh, know more or get involved, what's the best way to do that? Oh, so perfect. Um, we have, we're obviously all over social media. So you can find us on Facebook and Instagram, not Twitter. I think we have an account, but we haven't like been to it a long time. Uh, but then we also, our website has a ton of information. So if this, this is something that's piquing your interest and uh, you want to know more about like the services and how to report and what sexual violence is and what services look like. We just have a wealth of knowledge on that on that website. And, and again, it's something that we're really proud to maintain because we also know it's hard to reach out. So we want to make sure people have all the information possible if they don't feel comfortable just picking up the phone. But if you do feel comfortable picking up the phone, we have a hotline. It's answered all the time. Uh, we have a uh, I think it's something again like through the pandemic we've been really proud of like um not only have we maintained services this whole time but we're seeing more survivors than ever before um and it just shows like how important our work is so in 2021 we served 900 individuals in our community oh, so nice. this is and yeah it's been it's been kind of wild i think our like a handful of years ago um, when the Me Too movement was really coming out and things like that we had a year of 800 folks and that made a lot of sense but I, I don't know if we'll ever understand the aftermath of how sec, uh, pand the pandemic has uh, affected folks with sexual violence, but I'm just so glad we've been here for folks that have needed to call us, needed to access services. Um, and we pivoted completely. Our therapy is available online. It's also available in person. Um, and you, we really have been able to maintain those services. So a uh, caller hotline, you can, you, you can walk in but we also through the pandemic are preferring people call us before they come but i mean like we really our our goal is to be as low barrier and accessible as possible so there's lots of different ways folks can reach out to us nice nice well thank you so much for joining us that is uh that is great I, I hope maybe we can have another conversation with either yourself or someone from the staff in a uh in april um around sexual assault yeah. awareness month um that'd be great to kind of talk yeah. about that in a little more detail maybe some of the other programs but really do appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with us if anybody has any questions that you weren't able to ask you can go ahead and, and email those to my email down below and i'll also put it on the youtube recording um we're happy to, to answer that if i don't have an answer i'll, I'll send an email to chrissy and she'll get an answer uh for us as well. so uh, thank you so much chrissy have a, a great afternoon appreciate you taking your time all right thanks Will. all right have a great